Welcome back to The Power of Foods, uh, the special streaming edition of Saint Miguel of Blood and Guts. Uh, we have been talking about food industry uh, yesterday and the whole day today. Now we have Marco Kovac, Nicolas Pretzel, Pretzel and Miguel Pires. Guess what? We are talking about wine, independent wine uh, producers and winemakers. Uh, Miguel, uh, Marco and, uh, and uh, Nicolas, welcome to, to The Power of Food. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much to all of you at home. Let's do it. So let me only do a short presentation. Marco Kovac is, is, is from uh, Belgrade. He's now in Belgrade. No? Zagreb. Hey. Croatia. Uh, Different country. Yeah, but you are from, uh, transmitting from Belgrade. He's a, he's a wine and food lover. He's maybe one of the biggest globetrotters uh, in, in wine industry. He's the head of uh, Caracter Central and Eastern Europeans, leading orga organic wine saloon in, in Vienna. And he's also in charge of Kaga Anand's communication department. Niklas Pelser is a talent winemaker and works at the leg legendary biodynamic winery Meinklang. Miguel Pires, uh, one of the most respected Portuguese food writers. Uh, Miguel Pires is co-founder of Mesa Marcada website and, con and then contributor on Publico Cooking and Eater. Let's begin, guys. Guys, um... We have been talking about, uh, when we talk about the food industry uh, and the, the impact of the crisis, we have uh, mostly talking about restaurants, food and chefs. What about the wines? What about the wine making and the nature and the cycles? How does this crisis affect the, 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 the industry of wine? Miguel. I think Nicholas is the is the guy here who who, who does uh, who does the stuff. We just talk about it and bring it now. Uh, I think it's, it's because it's, it was a question that I, I I was told I had here for for him. I think he's the the best in position to answer to that. Once he, he lives in a farm, he works in a farm that has all this uh, holistic uh, system of working. And, and uh, everyone is talking about that, that we should uh, uh, bring back the basics and, and live in a more connected with nature. And I think no one is better than Nick to, to talk about that and, uh, and um, how it's uh, affecting, affected by this, uh, this crisis. Um, well, it's obviously a, a complex uh, question to answer. For us personally at the farm, um, I think we're doing okay yet. I think this is due to several reasons. First, we are mixed agriculture and not just a winery that helps us. I think that's why farms always used to be mixed agriculture. I think this is why it's such a challenge to focus on one thing or to specif specify in one specific product because if there's a crisis where you're focusing towards to uh, one industry or one uh, way of selling, then that can be an issue. So that helps us. We have also grains, we have cattle, we have other kinds of stuff, and that's obviously proceeding as normally. Um, for the wines and the wine world, also there, we don't feel it yet directly. I think it will be much later. I think um, the whole crisis, how, whatever that is, right, uh, it was more still standing and things are just a little bit on hold, but you don't feel them directly. I think, and Marco can agree on that, um, most of the wineries in the natural wine scene exporting quite a lot because the local market is quite uh, limited, especially in traditional areas like in Europe, I think in the most countries, yeah. it's, it's pretty limited because people are maybe not that open-minded yet to those wines. So uh, we export 90, 95% of the wines and this is a bit more long-term focus, right? When I sell a wine to America, um, get ordered it's there on the market maybe two months later realistically and like maybe sold out two and a half or three months later that the person actually has purchased the bottle or consumed it uh, so i think it will affect the wine world much later i think the benefit is that the scene was pretty vibrant before the market were pretty growing and stable for everyone so i think it comes in a kind of okay time um what you de definitely can see and tell is that the more expensive wines getting an issue and I think that's um, 
where it pays off a little bit to have a fair price system that you were maybe not reaching for the highest goal and just were like fighting in this niche of the niche and which is just sold in the restaurant industry uh, exclusively. This is obviously gone because no one at home opens now a bottle of wine for 80 bucks or hundred dollars, right? It's, it's mostly the maybe like daily consuming wine also because no, no one can explain it to you. There's no food pairing, all this experience with a wine, which is maybe more expensive, more valuable for you to spend that money. It's kind of gone. And, and, but so far we had a great feedback from a lot of people, a lot of restaurants. Uh, we have a big market in the United States. They starting bottling shops or bottle shops. They sell online. They do like food and wine pairings, which you can pre-order and then they deliver it. And for that, our wine's working quite well because they're quite accessible financially and also from the taste. I think Marco can talk better about that. He knows our wines better maybe than us. But um, that, that helped us. But I, of course, we are in close contact with a lot of other producers. Some struggle already, some not so much. Mostly the ones, again, who are in the domestic market strong, they see the impact directly. I think we and export will see it a bit later. Um, but also there, we are quite happy that we build it up also like different markets. So we are working good, for example, in the, in the monopoly in Quebec. Um, so they have a state monopoly where they sell the wine and this is obviously still going and better than ever. But obviously we're deeply connected to the restaurant industry because that's the people where those wines were transferred first. No one would have come in contact with natural wine or like pure made wines ever in the first place if there wouldn't have been a, the, the gastronomy or the, or the um, who care about products and how it's made. And that's uh, missing also the, the exchange between it, which I think is important. But we, I spoke with Marco the, the recent weeks a lot about that. And I think this is something we can't yet, um, you know, forecast or understand what impact it has, not just on the economically part of it, but also on the emotional part of it, on the whole development of, of that scene. Yeah. I mean, it, it has been... A challenge I think on many levels at this point um, and also opportunities I think I think everybody's talking about challenges and of course there's a lot of challenges but I think there's also a lot of opportunities at the same time um, I work with uh, a restaurant group in Bangkok called uh, Gagan Gagan Anand is the main restaurant which is one of the world's leading restaurants and we've been lucky to be able to turn like the whole wine list uh, at Kakan uh, to natural wines, which is the wines that I work with and which is the wines that I promote at the, at the salon. And obviously the sale of the wine has stopped because the restaurant has been closed and like all the other four restaurants in the group have been closed. We've been lucky actually to transport a container, like a 6,000 bottles of wine just before everything shut down. But then the problem is that the wines, once they arrive in Bangkok, you need to clear them from customs. And to be able to do that, you need to pay a lot of money. You don't have any, any profit coming in, and that's an issue. So now you have a lot of wines just standing still. At the same time, uh, what the guys in Bangkok did well, they developed a whole new network of private buyers. So actually, the wines they had left from before, they actually started selling to private buyers. And this will actually serve them well for the project uh, of a wine shop and a wine network that they will build in the months to come. So there is opportunities and there is uh, challenges at the same time. And uh, yes, as Nicholas said, all the, the, the more expensive wines are currently standing still because there isn't really a platform where you can sell them and people want to buy a lot of new stuff, especially with natural wines where, where people particularly in Asia, are still getting introduced to it a lot. So they want to try with more simple wines, and which are at the same time cheaper. And in regards to producers and the wine growers, the, as far as I spoke to them, for them currently this is not a problem because natural wine, which is the world where uh, Nicholas and I are, um, is based around small wine growers. So these are people that make 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 bottles. Well, my client as a winery is a bit of a different example, but that's another story. Uh, but all these people have not had any problems in placing their wines. So for the moment, for them, it's fine. Uh, and, but as Nicholas said, the, the, the next period will be a challenge when we see reopening of the restaurants and when we will have guests back in the restaurant to see what the consumption is. But I think the good thing is that the, the private consumption and the connection to private consumers has been developed much more than before. 
And this is the same as with, as with all the other ingredients. I think the connections have been made between producers and the private customers that possibly did not exist before. And honestly, I, I, I spoke to a lot of leading wine growers who said that even in the times of the shutdown, they had orders from the U.S. There was pallets going to, from the U.S. So there hasn't been like a complete lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, but as Nicholas said, I think the next period is actually going to be the crucial period because we also have to be aware that the next vintage is coming and that the sellers ideally would need to be emptied to a certain extent so you can actually have the next vintage coming because the nature that didn't, doesn't really care if there's actually a corona crisis or not. I was talking uh, with a, a small producer here, um, Tiago Tells, uh, half an hour ago, and he was telling me that uh, in March he, had, um, uh, he was supposed to, to make a shipment for US and it was uh, uh, cut. Mm. And uh, so he, 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 he didn't get any so the zero. In I see, this is interesting. If I may interrupt, this is, this is, this, this is where it gets very, very interesting. This is where uh, the choice of the distributor, well, the importer that you have comes into place. Because it depends on who you work with and it depends on the, the stability of your importer uh, in, in crisis like this is where this comes to, to a very, very, very good extent. Yeah. I agree on that. Uh, I think like it's important that you have a good, it's, I, I think that's the beauty on our scene. It's a little bit small and really built on relationships. Yeah. We had the same, like more, more rather positivity and good vibe from the people and being more creative and trying to uh, find a way to sell the wines and support uh, our producers as, as much as possible. And that I, don't know, I don't know all the details, but I think it's better someone to cut me than uh, buy to me and, ne and then it doesn't pay me. So or that, that doesn't have the condition because sometimes it's not hard to sell. It's harder to... to yeah. It's actually... Uh, and, and I believe that like, uh, like happened to, to you, to some of these small producers that I, that I know him and that, that I know here and that I talk, uh, they, they all had a different experience in the past and I think they are working with the right guys uh, in, in London because we need to export too, even we are a producer and a, um, a market consumer. And uh, for instance, in Portugal, even now that, is a, that was a, finally a boom in the last two years in this um, raw or natural wine that we want to talk about. It. It's always very hard to know the, the best definition. And uh, the last, and, and the, the local restaurants and local shops, and it, it became a kind of a community. And uh, besides a few gigs, I believe that 80 and 90 percent of the, 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 the wines consumed are, are, are Portuguese. Uh, usually, you, you, by this time or in May, you don't have white wines to sell to restaurants because it was also sold out from these small producers. Okay. So, um, what happens is that what they produce and they, they are small, uh, I don't know. I don't know if any of these ones produce more than 3,000 bottles. It's not the one that produces more than, than uh, half a million, Marco. <laughs> but uh, um, they depend, of course, on, on export, exportation too, especially to, uh, it was, it's the, the, that main and mature market that uh, can help them to, um, to have the money and then to, to keep the, the, the things working. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, some of them, them said to me that, uh, okay, it's not a problem now, yet this month, even if someone cut me an achievement or something like that, but will be in the, in the close future because uh, there's, a, there's no, this is going to be closed for a while, for a, more than a while, a long while, and that's, how to balance things, no? I think it's a really good point. You talked about the uh, payment when I can jump in. Uh, I think like, obviously we were, especially in the beginning, because you don't know what happens, right? And I feel right now, again, it's like more just like everything's still standing. Everything's kind of freeze. And I spoke with a lot of partners of ours and they say the same. You can't like, no one pays them. No one, you can't even go to a lawyer. Most, you know, like this, this whole system is not working. So, I'm a bit more 
scared and afraid of what will happen if things open and world goes back to normal and everyone cares when solidarity is starting to disappear again and people care about their own business and be like, okay, I don't get paid, so I don't pay. And I think this mentality was anyways there already way too long. Again, we are lucky that we have good, good established partners, which, you know, again, in the edge wine scene is pretty stable and build on trust. If you once lost your reputation on that, you will never be able to find the uh, true natural winemakers because we all talk with each other all the time. Uh, and um, when I, Marco and me, and many of us, we speak all the time together about importers and we all see each other the whole time. So it's, just, it's like a little family. So you know who you can trust and who not. So we have a really trustworthy relationship. But I totally agree. Like if I would be in a situation, and we've been in situations like that when I have an importer where I have to be unsure because I know they might don't be that stable then I also would prefer to have a cancelled order than shipping it and then don't get paid because that's more than Fortunately, <laughs> sorry, Mark. No, I, for example, as I work with the wines in Southeast Asia, I had to send email to all of my uh, wine growers that I work with, that I pay, and that, I, that supply me, saying the situation is like, we did this last shipment before the lockdown. I have no idea when the next shipment is going to happen. So it was a very honest email where I said, I have no idea when the next shipment is going to happen. We have wines allocated with you. I, did, I don't know when we will be able to pay for them. And honestly, I have to sit still and I have to see how the situation resolves. And I this can, is where- I can, I can confirm that he wrote that email. I received I it. did. And, and so did. The, the nature of the natural wine community, which is kind of small, where everybody knows each other, yeah. And the good side is that everybody kind of understands and everybody is a family business. So I'm not talking to a corporation that does a million bottles. I'm talking to people who have small productions and they understand because they're in the same situation. And this is, this is like the, the good side of the natural wine community, which, is, uh, yeah, which presented itself in this crisis. And once this, the lockdown stops, we will be again working together to see how we can bridge this gap because already now with my partners in Asia I'm talking about okay can we set this sum of money more for the next shipment can we maybe ship parts of the wine can we do it in a couple of installments and if I communicate this to our wine growers they will understand yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm to do probably some maybe for the I, probably the guys who had more problems will be the ones with a medium uh, size. The big corporations, they will have some damage, but they have uh, more resources to, to face that. And, and the small ones with all this solidarity and when they work with, uh, for instance, in Portugal, the market is very small for this kind of wines and most of them work with the same curator that is uh, called uh, Bugliardo. And, uh, and they worked for ages, for more than 10 years, and even be before it became a trend in, in, in Lisbon or in Portugal, uh, they worked with this, this importer that it, it is to uh, a curator and distributor. So, and we had another, we had a crisis 10 years ago or less than that. So we are uh, resilient and some of them are resilient. Of course, the, um, the issue sometimes is probably the ex exportation that is very fundamental. But if you work with the, 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 the right guys, uh, the right importers, you probably uh, have that solidarity. I follow them, I follow what they do and who they work to, and uh, they, they tell stories about the past of bad experience, but you fine-tuned you fine your... your um, your um, communication and your uh, your partners, and but, then you get the right the right thing. But we also need to be aware that there is wine growers that literally live on the edge. Uh, maybe not in, in in like economically good countries, but there are areas, for example, in France, where people would give everything they have to build like a small winery which produces 5,000 bottles a year. And in a good year, they live on balance. So this year is a, is a, is a kind of a catastrophe for them because they will, how will they be able to pay the bills? And we need to think about that too. Yeah. And 
so this is this is also the other side of the coin. Um, I some think also are, what what I saw from from us, like we are for the natural wine, we're pretty big. You know, we make oh, we make over half a million of bottles of wine a year, and we are like for that really big as a natural wine producer. Um, so I think we know also sometimes our business. You know, of course, you know at that size, you understand your your your, your business, what you're doing as well. Um, I think I, I know a lot of producers who don't have the control over the business maybe so much because, you know, they are small enough to don't care really, you know, or don't have anyone who helps them uh, or any employee or anything. So I think for them, it can be even harder. I, I, people I spoke with were actually more the smaller ones, which are have, getting no orders because they are also most likely the ones with more expensive ones. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that can be actually more an issue. Um, but I do agree what you said before that um, like middle-sized wineries can have an issue. I think it is the same thing what often, ha- often happens in a crisis. If you have a good profile, if you really have a good identity, if you really know what you're doing, if you're based on like something real, you know, and, on, on, and standing with your feet on the ground and being humble about what you're doing and in your daily work, and you go through that like always, and it can be a chance, you know, like as Marco said before, it can be a beautiful chance actually to develop a great... Like in restaurants, authenticity yeah. would be a, a, a key word. Yeah. But of course, we, we sometimes you don't like to use the word business because it looks like business is just big corporation. But even if you just produce 1,000 bottles, you, yeah, you should business, yeah. how to run a business. A yeah. business. And this is, this, is, this is my point for this crisis, and I'm not sure it's going to be a positive one, because I think this is a time where, you have the, where restaurants have an opportunity to change things. Everybody's talking about sustainability, but not a lot of restaurants are actually sustainable, and not a lot of restaurants are actually working towards real sustainability. Mm-hmm. So if I have a restaurant which is like a top 50 restaurant, and I'm buying... Uh, wines from the biggest corporations because this is the easiest, it's the, they're the easiest to sell. This is not sustainability. And yeah. this, I think, uh, is a good opportunity for people to think what they're buying, to, to uh, rethink their suppliers. Mm-hmm. Who are you supporting? Why are you supporting these people? Who are you giving money to? What are you paying? Why are you not buying organic wines? Because there are so many organic wines uh, out there in the market of different profiles, and you can find your own. Uh, out of the top 10 uh, restaurants on the 50 best list, I honestly think that it's only Noma and us who have completely natural wine list. We have a wide selection of wines, which are from, a, from small producers, which are not just supporting small families, but it's also ecologically, uh, it's of course much better. And again, it's better for the consumer. You're not drinking all the chemicals that you have and all the artificial flavors that you have in non-organic wines. So I think the, the crisis is an opportunity for restaurants to rethink who are they working with and who are they supporting and what they're actually promoting. I think this is a real chance. I but I'm kind of half pessimistic about this. And nobody has been actually talking about the possibility to change the chain of supply this takes a lot of effort. I understand that at this point, the priority is to save jobs. I understand that the priority is to keep the operation running. Uh, but I would also like to see people talk about sustainability in terms of suppliers and what they promote in the end of the rest. I, I totally agree with you. And I think this is also the chance I talked before to, you, you have finally the time, right? We had never the time in like the last, like how long it's going just crazier and crazier and bigger and more intensive also in that scene right also in the natural wine scene it's crazy gatherings all the time all over the world we can reflect a little bit and understand what i can do better what is maybe like important and not important and i think in restaurants and also for, uh, i totally agree with you i think because you have such a good relationship maybe with like people who work real you know um you go through that together and you will definitely find ways to to uh, get new opportunities but if you just buy somewhere and being a number on 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 supply and that goes from from top to bottom you know and 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 then you obviously struggle and then you also struggle because you have as you said before now authenticity 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 one hundred. We have, a, we have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a question from Onienka Mainolovic 
and she has two questions actually. One is, would you say that the crisis is showing the fragility of the large scale production, the global market perhaps, and the resilience of smaller, shorter supply chain winemakers? Wine markets, sorry. You want to repeat? Yeah, I wasn't getting that read. Yeah. She asks, thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Onien Kavainolovic. I'll try to, to, to make the, the question again. Would you say that this crisis is showing the fragility of the large scale production, the, go the global market perhaps, and the resilience of smaller, shorter supply chain wine markets? Did you get it now? Yeah, yeah I, I, I got it. Um, if I just may start first, I think the crisis will, um, what it will produce is, I'm hoping it produces a um, way of thinking of the general consumer towards more healthy options. Let's be completely honest and say that alcohol is not the healthiest thing in the world, but as long as you're drinking it, you might as well be drinking better alcohol. And that's organic wine, that's biodynamic wine, that's natural wine. So I think a consumer uh, who may have had the time to rethink his health options at this point, because people had a lot of time to think, uh, they may rethink towards going more organic and going more natural. And this is what I'm hoping happens. Uh, I think the large scale producer will just continue to exist, but I'm hoping that the ladder kind of shifts slightly towards people that produce uh, more sustainable, more sustainably. She goes, uh, she goes on and she asks, will winemakers need support and rescue in, in, uh, in uh, the case of the prolonged crisis as well as due to, to climate change, which is likely to be the next disruptive element that winemakers will face? I think that's a really uh, hard question to answer and really individual, right? I mean, this is like, we are not people who like would like think now the option is to get subsidies from that somehow because i'm thinking what's the solution of that like someone has to pay their money too and I, when you see already all these loans right now going on yesterday the us get three tri trillion new loan in, in in money i think like who pays that you know and i think if you talk about sustainable wine growing and sustainable like living or the lifestyle we try to have on our farm it's also has to be uh, economically sustainable you know and i think it's not it's not the best option just to try to like think okay let's try to get a fund or like a help somehow but that really depends on each producer you know i, I can't i think everyone has an individual case on that and that's what it makes it so hard it's the same for restaurants right you you don't know if behind a restaurant is a billionaire who actually can easily like could pay their stuff without a problem and then on the other hand you have people where it doesn't might look like but they're actually struggling and build it up with their own private money you know it's super hard to say i, I can't tell that fast it's not the way we look on it, we try to find new ways, you know, and, and, and we open our uh, short-term farm shop, as I spoke with Marco today, uh, we just get the option just doing it and try to gain some other business through that on, and possibilities. But we also know towards working on our daily business and on our daily uh, life uh, to make the biggest business or the biggest income out of it. Right, I think that's for the most restaurants I know and like, and this is the same for the wineries I know and like, not the main goal. So as long as we can live from it, and I think on a farm you always live pretty well, especially in a crisis, as long as we can do that, we're not working towards that. Um, but sure, there are people who might need help, but I don't know. No? Mm -hmm. It's a good point. It looks like it comes from Central Europe <laughs> in, a, in a good way, because here, even, even if you don't need a subsidy, if your business is good, but you have an opportunity to get it, you go and get it. And sometimes this is an issue because it, it looks like we don't learn with nothing. We had a crisis in 2009, 10, 
and we didn't recover uh, 100% or maybe we recovered the last two or three years, but it was all the excesses. And now we are talking, oh, this is an opportunity to change the way we live and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And then after two years, we forget e easily. And I still, for me, I, I still have some marks of the, the previous crisis. I, I changed from my, my, my job. I work for a big multinational. I had this opportunity to leave, but it was an opportunity because that's, that way of working was not working anymore and they, have wanted, they needed to be rid of some people and some people like me had that, that opportunity. So I changed a uh, lot of stuff. But when I talk to people, then after one year, it looks like that nothing, nothing happens. And we have all these excesses and now everyone wants uh, subsidies. And what's this, for instance, in general, I was um, listening to the Tourism Board uh, Secretary of State that January and February uh, for tourism in Portugal, we, we, we were still in growing. But uh, I remember to talk with people from restaurants and in January and February was the, the, um, the income was going down. Why? Because there was lots of restaurants that were open trying to, you know, to surf, the, to surf the wave of the tourism, so open and open in a crazy way. And now is the, the, the government or the state that has to support everyone, or we should uh, let fall some business that were not sustainable, economically sustainable, or is the government that's going to help everyone? How you, how you, you know, you split the, the good ones for, for the bad ones. That is million yeah. dollars. You see that worldwide, there's funds right now happening and then super rich companies actually who don't need that money, taking money out of those funds. And then it's the question, well, who pays that funds at the end? You know, isn't that not towering even more into capitalism and supporting the people who maybe have the it's money? It's a bit crazy. I mean, it's a, cr a bit crazy because how we can, in one of the previous podcast uh, conversations, was saying how in America, it's like the biggest restaurants are getting the, the subsidies. And that's, that's like completely crazy. But I think instead of talking about subsidies, there's another question, and which I firmly believe, and that is, if you build your business in a sustainable way, you will be able to go through this crisis. If you do a product which is a good product, if you have a good philosophy behind the product, this is a temporary crisis which will be resolved. A concrete example, so commercial wines, which you find in supermarkets, which are cheap wines, for example, they are made, so they have to be consumed within six months. For example, in Croatia, where I'm from, we have a tourist season, and then wine growers, they produce wines, so they can be consumed in like six months. So these are like short-lived wines. So if you go into September and October, these wines are completely dead. So if you're thinking like this, you're in a problem. But if you're thinking in building a good wine, investing in your vineyards financially in every other way, your wine is something which is a value in your cellar and you will be able to sell it because you will establish a cooperation with good restaurants, which will be good partners, which will buy, which currently maybe are not buying the wines, but six months and a year, they will be buying the wines, they will be getting the wines, so your wines will rotate. And that's a kind of a medium to long-term thinking. And it's, it's a matter of philosophy rather than thinking about, oh, what subsidies I'm going to get. It's like, I think this is a chance to more like think about the philosophy of your, what is it that actually you are doing? What is the business that you're involved in? I think in that case, you can be saved in a way. Guys, we are, we are running out of time. Uh, Six minutes. Actually, we thought, we, we believed in the beginning that 30 minutes, 40 minutes will be more than enough. It's but enough. it's not enough. Uh, I'm so sorry. I have uh, Manuel Paiva here with another question. He says, don't you think people need to be educated first about natural wines? That's that old stuff. I think last five years here, we, we were just talking about that. But sometimes even, even among the community, we don't get a, uh, um, a way to, to, uh, to speak about what is really, you know, what, what I feel is like, yes, but in the other way, it looks like sometimes there's a community that has no special interest, that the thing became too wide because otherwise it becomes a trend. The industry wants to come in and take advantage of that. 
So that's an impression that I have uh, sometimes. And then that education, I think people, there's lots of information. There's a lot of bad information too, but there's lots of information. And, uh, and that's lots of people has to be interested in the subject too. It's, they don't, I, don't, I don't agree much that we, you have to, you know, to prepare your baby food and all the time for people. The people, people have to go and learn. It's not, a, it's not people talk about sometimes a, a stamp. No? Why there's no stamp about a, what is a natural, a natural wine? If you I, read, I, I mean, read, you will find the right guys who do the right thing. And you have the good guys in Portugal. You have people like Pedro Eduardo de Capucha, Joao Tavares, you have uh, Humus. You have that beautiful place which was called Café Tati, which sadly closed down. You have Prado, which is a good place to discover good natural wines. And these are all people that educate. You also have very good importers. Uh, there's guys like Alejandro. There is Jennifer that imports the wines. There is the, uh, the pioneers, which are, Miguel, which are your friends. Yeah, yeah. It's, we've been talking about contact with these people. They will give you all the knowledge. I'm sure that you that they will serve you wines. They will they will give you samples. There is also events like the event that I do in Austria in December every year, where Mein Klein as a winery comes every year and they give us huge support. Where you can actually taste like a hundred wines in in one day. So um, there's a lot of information out there. And Miguel, I know, is a supporter of good wines and good natural wines. So you read Miguel. And, and, a lot of different different out there. and I actually started liking it. And I think this is so many in our scene, you know, they just like felt first, first time ever, like that, that something speaks to them. It's maybe the same with coffee right now, right? Like everyone kind of hates the standard coffee, but people drink it because they think they have to. But if you then come across real farmed coffee, like from real people, then you're like, wow. And I think people don't have to, you can totally get nerdy into it. And like Wizard Winery says, plenty of fairs, plenty of blogs, plenty of podcasts from all over the world, so widely available, even books. I mean, Marco, who would have thought that five years ago we have books about natural wine and there's so many now, you know? Yeah, yeah. I information. But I think it's about, let me maybe just finish that quick. It's like, I think much more about what you feel and it's the same with food, no? It's like people should go back to the importance of, of, of the base, you know, and like feel something. They should drink it, just feel good by it. And if you created that sensibility, you naturally know what a natural wine is. No one needs to tell me that anymore. I've chased the wine and I know there's, a, there's a energy into it. And I don't need to know what variety and who's making it that's interesting on top. But for me, it's important if it has a character and a soul. And if it has that, and if you finally experience that, and I think a lot of people in the gastronomy, in the food world, have the sensibility because they are already coming across a lot of really good produ products, you know, in, in food or whatever. And, and you have to just focus towards that in wine. And if you, if you like really feel that, then you have all you need. And then you have all the information you have. Then you have more information than any summer you can give you because they are just caring about the effects they have in their mind. They're not I, I think it's much better that you go around tasting wines rather than going to a sommelier course and then teaching you about regions, teaching you about how this should taste, that should taste. Although you can, you can contact, if you're in Portugal, get in touch with Alejandro. I think he does uh, quite a few courses. Um, but in general, I think it's about what you taste. You drink the wine. And I think you, that's the, that's the way to educate yourself. You just taste what you like and whatever you like, that's a good wine for you. Nobody yeah, else can tell you what is a good wine. These last years, uh, me and more and some other guys even better than me, is about the, having these wines, having availability of these wines to sell in, the, in some shops and in, in a restaurant. It's not, I'm not against the commercial or industrial wines. I have a, vision a little bit different from you probably but what I have is people have the right to choose and availability to choose because yeah. sometimes it looks like that you know special CD that your friend talking about but you couldn't hear it now it's easy. guys we guys. have to go amazing talk but... uh, yeah it was amazing thank you so much please stay there don't leave us Miguel you will stay with us for sure yeah. for the next yeah. slot thank you so thank you so much Lots. Really nice. Lots. We'll be back at, uh, at, C at 4 30 Lisbon time with uh, Gagana from, uh, from Bangkok.
and uh, Miguel Pires. Mar Marco, just only uh, hugs to Zagreb and not Bogrado. Sorry for yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. I was trying to get there. Yeah. Oh, mistake. Okay. Sorry. They can be really sensitive in that, that <laughs> part of Europe. You have to be really yeah. careful about that. Not Marco, say, say gracias to Paul. <laughs> well, guys, thank, thank you so much. You so much. Uh, you at home, we will be back at 4.30 Lisbon time with uh, Gagana and Miguel Pires again. Please stay there. Stay with us. Ciao, guys. Ciao. Ciao.